So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm French chamber welcome to Ian Spaulding. Great. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Anson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for coming today. And I, I hope the next uh, 45 minutes that we have together, which will be 15 minutes of my talk, uh, trying to set the stage about transparency, linking it to supply chain and consumer. And then we're going to actually have a panel discussion around that where we'll bring in two very strong manufacturers. I think these are household names for those of you who source garments, uh, Luintai and Crystal. Uh, as well as uh, Laura from uh, Bureau Veritas uh, to come in and share their perspective on the issue of transparency. So what I've done is I've just put together a kind of a 15 minute sort of presentation that talks a little bit about consumer expectations because a lot of people talk about corporate social responsibility, about sustainability, and they, rare, they gloss over the fact that where is the consumer in the discussion? Uh, they tend to talk about, well, it's a government regulation or it's a buyer re uh, requirement, et cetera, but we often miss the fact that there are consumers and they make choices every day. Some of them make choices to buy from more sustainable kind of products and some don't. Some just buy based on price. Uh, and so I think that discussion uh, is, is part of what we want to discuss today. Uh, we also wanted to introduce kind of very high level, and I think this will not be a surprise to most of you, that uh, in the last uh, probably five years, there's a lot of changes as it relates to the legislation, but also about what consumers want, or at least what they say they want. What they want and what they say they want may be two different things. But that combined with uh, kind of the increase in technology relating to supply chain mapping and uh, kind of getting better oversight of factories around the world is leading to kind of an emerging trend, which is how do we actually put more information available publicly so that consumers can make more educated decisions about is this product better for them or not based more than just price or quality or brand. So that's the gist of what I'd like to talk about. And so these are the types of questions we're going to discuss uh, uh, during the panel as well. So what are we talking about in supply chain transparency? Uh, what, what are the kind of impetus behind it? Uh, what are the risks? Because there are risks. I'm sure many of you don't want your competitor to know which factory you are working with. Uh, but. Uh, obviously, those risks are, are there, but some people say there's also benefits to, to radical transparency. So well, let me get started by, by kind of reminding us where we were in 2008. So 2008 was kind of an interesting year, particularly in China. Two incidents happened, one with Baxter, one with sort of the milk uh, 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 products where, where there was some contamination with melamine and also with uh, heparin, the drug that is an anticoagulant uh, that is often used, uh, that, that Baxter has um, the IP on. Uh, Basically, both of these products were contaminated, and it led to uh, a certain amount of deaths. In the case of the milk production, I think we had uh, more than 12 infants uh, who died and 300,000 children that were impacted, uh, uh, almost 100 that were actually in the hospital. And there was uh, massive recalls, and it was a big wake-up call for, uh, and changed, uh, as we all know, if we live in Hong Kong, it changed uh, uh, the demand for milk, right? Uh, so it's still common to see Thousands upon thousands of people crossing the border every day bringing milk uh, over. And uh, partly it's because of uh, there's a lack of trust in that supply chain and that chain of custody as to what that product is and, and actually the, the ingredients that went into it. The same thing was true with drugs. And I think you could come up with maybe a dozen or so examples of where supply chain gone wrong. You know, somebody didn't know the raw materials, or there was contamination, or there was somehow mislabeling. Uh, and it, it's raised awareness at a governmental level. It's also raised awareness at a consumer level that we, as consumers, need to have better protections, and there needs to be better oversight into this chain of custody. If you look from a uh, sort of moving on to more of a supply chain, a traditional kind of poor working conditions, these tragedies that have happened in, in global apparel manufacturing, but also in, in the electronics as well, uh, where, where Foxconn has been criticized for years about uh, the labor practices in, in their manufacturing uh, base. Uh, we, we also are recognizing that consumers are kind of surprised often that there are poor working conditions uh, in the factories that make their product. And so in the last year, almost a year ago to this day, there was the Rana Plaza incident in Bangladesh where more than 1,100 people died. And uh, there was a, a massive movement since that time where buyers from the West have been working together Together to form these industry associations to kind of address this and make sure it never happens again. But one of the key outcomes or learnings from this incident uh, that happened in either Rana Plaza or Tazreen, the other fire that happened in Bangladesh, was uh, buyers didn't know where their product was made. They say they knew. 
They wrote a purchase order to somebody, but actually there was an unauthorized subcontracting. There was very little kind of uh, oversight in the process. If you remember, in the case of Benetton, I, I hope Benetton's not here today, but because uh, uh, what I'm about to say they might disagree with, but. Um, they, it took them a while to figure out whether they were really in Rana, actually. And there were a number of other companies who struggled with that as well. They fumbled. Uh, people asked, were you in the factory? And they couldn't answer it in a coherent way. They changed their story. And a lot of other companies did that as well. I think the Children's Place was also criticized in, in some respects. J.C. Penney's, they bought product that was not... Uh, their product, it was branded by somebody else, but nonetheless it was ended up in their stores. So it raised questions about the supply chain and how much do we really know about it. Um, in addition, uh, what we've also seen in the last five to eight years is a, is a pretty significant increase in kind of legislation asking for more labeling, better information down to the product level. People are demanding uh, better oversight in that process, and, and that's global. That's not specific to the United States or Europe. It also is happening in China as well. In addition, we see some legislation come in, at least in the, in the United States. There's two particular things that have happened that, that have raised awareness for publicly traded companies or companies that operate in California and that they need to disclose more about their supply chain and what efforts they're, they're doing in order to prevent things like slavery or forced labor in their supply chain or the use of conflict minerals, uh, something that, that there is actually a legal requirement that they say you cannot source uh, from uh, certain uh, parts of Africa where there are conflict minerals as part of the supply chain. In addition, we see those initiatives that I mentioned uh, um, that, that happened as a result of the Rana Plaza incident, both the Accord in Europe and the Alliance in North America, have tried to put um, more information on the website about the supply chain of the brands or, fact, uh, or retailers that are part of that. Uh, we also see in the last five to eight years a massive increase in the amount of information that's publicly available by brands themselves. Uh, we've seen a, more than 10 years ago Gap uh, and Levi's released their factory information. And everybody said, why are you doing that? That's sensitive information. I could buy that product and then go and, and, and talk to the factory owner and try and uh, uh, replicate that product at a cheaper price and compete with you. But what they have found, and, and lots of other companies have followed suit, is that there wasn't that negative uh, impact to their uh, sourcing practices. And so we've seen more and more brands disclose, from coffee companies to technology, what Apple is disclosing today, to Patagonia. Uh, in, the, in the example on the left, you'll see Patagonia is kind of disclosing all of their factories, and they're kind of making it easy. They're linking it to Google Maps and actually showing you how big the factory is, the number of workers in the factory, what they produce, uh, and maybe even some of the critical issues that they found in the factory. In the example of Apple, they disclose all of their tier one suppliers. They also disclose all of the working hours for more than 1.3 million workers that are involved in Apple production. And that's done on a monthly basis. It's kind of crazy to think about. Uh, five years ago, Apple was criticized for basically not doing enough. And now, uh, the, one of the most secretive companies in the world is basically out there sharing information about working hours for more than a million workers. And they do it every month. Uh, Starbucks, another example, they basically, uh, through their cafe practices, their purchasing practices, disclose a lot about where they buy their coffee beans, the prices they pay, uh, and the conditions uh, on the farms, uh, as well as the manufactured goods that go into a Starbucks. This is just another example of, fact of, uh, of the factories that are being disclosed. Uh, Apple publishes their supplier list. H&M has done so for several years. Uh, and uh, the, the initiatives of uh, uh, the 150 buyers that are part of the Accord have also agreed to publish their factory list uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, and the same thing is true in North America. Now, when you combine all of that with the fact that now, we, a days, we have a lot more technology available to us to make supply chain mapping easier and faster and more accurate. Uh, so it's no longer kind of enough to say, I didn't know where, who made my product, because it's relatively easy to map out where the money goes, okay, who you pay for that purchase order, and where ultimately that production takes place, if there's a, an interest of the brand or retailer to do that. If they don't want to do that, then of course they can just receive the goods in Europe or the United States without knowing which factories are making them. But we see technology like SourceMap, which is a kind of a supply chain mapping. We've seen a number of other technologies uh, that are out there to help companies uh, track back to the factory, tier one, as well as tier two and tier three, down to raw material level. Oops. Um, 
In addition, we also see now with RFID, with QR codes, with of course our, our, our lovely barcodes that are, that are on all the literature from the French Chamber here, uh, we see it's a lot easier to track at a product level, uh, ultimately, um, uh, at a product level, what, um, uh, where that product is, maybe even the chain of custody associated with, uh, with that product. Um, and so we also see this massive increase with QR codes and scanning technology where more and more adults uh, who have smartphones are using the, that technology to, in order to really gain access to discounts or to identify maybe things that might be cheaper, but also to learn more about the product or service. Uh, in addition, people are trying to link all of this to sustainability. And, Things like the Higgs Index have come along with the Sustainable Apparel Initiative, uh, and that is intended to try and link all of the sustainability work down to the consumer level, make it easier for consumers through a labeling mechanism to know that that factory is a good factory, that product is a good factory. So all of this is leading to kind of now this new thinking that we are very close to being able to link all of the sustainability efforts, supply chain mapping efforts with technology down to the product level. Uh, and so some people have called it radical transparency where we're no longer kind of keeping our supply chain secret, that we're actually disclosing a lot more uh, with it. Now, um, at what I would say, and I, I know I have limited time before we get to the panel, is that the, a lot of the data is actually already out there. And what I found interesting is last year, TradeSpark came and presented at this conference, and they actually shared information about how they are capturing uh, shipment information. And so uh, if you've never been on TradeSpark, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. There are other sites as well that do this. But what I can do uh, now, without actually getting permission from any of you, is I could actually begin to do searches on your companies and the products that you're buying. And it is, if it's shipped to certain markets, other markets, you can't get this. But, but for certain markets, you can. So let's just take an example of Tesco, because I think Tesco's in the room. So we'll, we'll just show them. If by chance, uh, I wanted to actually learn about bananas, because I found out that bananas uh, have a certain fungus that might be hazardous to my health, and that there might actually be an impact on all bananas coming from Panama, I could search that. I could then search on TradeSpark or other similar technologies uh, where uh, bananas from Panama are, coming, are, are, are being shipped to. I could realize that they're being shipped to Tesco. I could follow the information on this uh, supply chain by purchase order. And then I could ultimately link it to the product that's in the stores today. Now, if uh, Tesco or other companies, as or whatever, uh, disclose the country of origin, which in some countries they're legally obligated, it makes it that much easier. But in this case, I could actually track it and see which companies are receiving that type of product. Uh, and then, of course, I can search it and find out if there's an alternative uh, at a similar price. In this case, there, there's uh, certain online uh, technologies that allow me to actually search for bananas from another country of origin or from another store, even at a cheaper price. So this is just one quick example of how a consumer or how an activist or campaign or government could begin to pull data together and link it and see if they understand the supply chain, whether the brand or retailer wants them to or not. Okay. Another example, woven shirt from Uniglo. So I could actually go online, find out the woven shirt. I could then search through TradeSpark, and I could find out that, uh, that we actually have uh, shipments coming from our friends from Lu and Tai. I just want to show you the examples here, OK? Uh, that, and they're shipping product to, to Uniglo right now. Uh, and, and we actually can know, we don't know the country of origin. We know it's shipped through Hong Kong. We assume it could be Vietnam. We could assume it could be actually uh, China, et cetera. So this is information that's available publicly today. Okay. Now let's do a different example. I, I don't want to pick on you know companies too much here, but let's do an, a different example. Let's assume I wanted to actually check the quality of food in a restaurant or a hotel. In some parts of the world, there are inspections that happen, and those inspections are made publicly. So in the state of Louisiana and in the United States, you could search every single restaurant that has a business license in the entire state. You can do the same thing in California. And you could ultimately find out, pick the restaurant of your choice. You could scan forward. You could see that that restaurant has actually gone through an inspection for food quality, food safety. And the information is there. And I can see that they had some critical issues. And we can see what issues have been corrected or not corrected. And I can see the results of uh, that inspection uh, down to uh, 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 some type of grade. Or I could see that, um, uh, that they, they, they don't have a sanitizer test kit, is not provided, you know, et cetera. So there are these things that are readily available for consumers. Now, 
a lot of people say, well, that's a very scary proposition that actually there are some downside to this radical transparency that could put my business in jeopardy or, 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 or supply chain in jeopardy. But I've found that there's also equally a number of benefits that could happen. So and here's are just very two quick ones. Tesco, for example, in Korea has actually done some pretty interesting things using QR codes to link to products to expand their footprint in terms of their stores. So on the, uh, the Korean subway, for a period of time, Tesco actually had pictures of product and allow consumers, while they're waiting for the train, to actually shop products that they needed and actually have them delivered to their home. So you didn't actually expand your retail footprint, you just used advertising, linking it to product and technology as a way to actually make it easier for consumers to buy goods. Now, that's good for ease of use and, and ultimately to uh, uh, expand your, your market share, but there's also benefits as it relates to sustainability. So uh, a lot of us who buy fish in Hong Kong today, you will actually see a QR code and it might give you greater confidence to know where that fish came from, uh, if it was a different country of origin or, or the conditions under which. So there are uh, some technologies that can give greater assurance to consumers uh, that actually the, the company that manufactured that or grew that or actually actually harvested that uh, product ultimately uh, is, uh, is doing so in a, in a responsible manner. So my final slide, and then I'll turn it back to Anson to open it up for a, 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 um, a polling question, is within five years, I, I don't think, I think you, you could probably see some announcements in the next two years, but within five years you're going to see several major brands and retailers disclosing everything on their website down to the product level. I think everyone, I'm hearing a lot of retailers talk about doing that and they're just building the infrastructure and confidence that they know where the factory is and that we don't have the unauthorized subcontracting issue. So in a, in, in a few more years, we're gonna get down to the raw material level, uh, have that chain of custody for organic cotton or any type of raw materials that go into a product uh, uh, and, and to disclose that publicly and to link it to the product. Now, the, what benefit will that be? That's the difficult question which I think we're gonna ask. Will it result in an increase in sales? Will it result in a stronger brand? Will it result in any negative consequences? I think that'll be a conversation that we're gonna have for the panel, but I think we're very close to actually seeing uh, this come to fruition. For those of you who know QR codes, uh, you could learn who I am and all that, but, but I'm gonna force you to, to, to get uh, uh, savvy with technology. So, uh, so ultimately, there's information about the company that I work for, about me, and if you wanna contact me, you can do that through that, okay? Anson? We seem to be having a little bit of uh, noise and uh, vibrations. That is not me walking along the floor, I can assure you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thanks, Ian. Um, glad you shared that with us. Um, I was busily writing down some notes, um, but it is amazing, isn't it? The, 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 this whole supply train tracking, and as you said, the data is out there goes back to my earlier point about that data analytics. Lots of information available. Okay.